Okay. Will audiences remain split on M. Night Shyamalan? Episode 63. Yes, absolutely. Audiences will remain split over M. Night Shyamalan because of these two factors. One, the newer generation of millennials or millennial moviegoers are unwitting to who Shyamalan is and his previous films. They did not have to suffer or endure the turbulent times of the early 2000s when Shyamalan made films consistently. Almost every two years, Shyamalan produced a film during the early 2000s. And people bought tickets wanting, expecting that good old feeling they got from the sixth sense. And in return, they received signs, which we realize now alien hate is real. You make a bad alien movie and they will come at you. The village, which had too much of a twist to the twist ending and lady in the water, too much talking and no ghost moviegoers today are unaware of the seesaw ride Shyamalan put us through after the Sixth Sense debuted at um, Cannes in 2003. The movie tied with Captain Conan that year for top prize. Shyamalan was heralded as the next Alfred Hitchcock or some offshoot of the British master of suspense. We expected each film he produced after The Sixth Sense to frighten the bejesus out of us with his shrillmatic style. And shrillmatic is a mix between thrill and suspense. Shrillmatic. However, that didn't happen. The thrill was gone, but not necessarily eliminated because people still had hope that Shyamalan would come back and make a decent film again that audiences would like. Now, much of my opinion about Split is swayed by the ending. And the fact that it's part of a series I wished Shyamalan would have explored years ago. Aside from that, I thought the movie was well put together and with a convincing storyline and actors who performed their parts well. There's no doubt Shyamalan is a good filmmaker. Watch the happening with the sound off. He understands the camera and how to convey aesthetics used in conventional and non-conventional filmmaking. The guy is a student of film. However, these storytelling techniques can often obstruct the main idea of the film and how act one smoothly transitions to act two and then drags in act three. Now, Split is a good film. Good in the essence that is entertaining, well acted and thought provoking. But there was that time there in the final act where the scenes too long allowed the tension of the story to subside into a light drizzle of suspense with a possible chance of a plausible sequel. The actors in this movie performed brilliantly. You had Betty Buckley, James McAvoy, and Anna Taylor-Joy. All three of them great, gave great performances. Now, Buckley, she was, um, she's a famous Broadway actress who plays the part of Dr. Fletcher, Hedwig's therapist. A lot of people were turned off by this edition of the story just because her interjected lectures within the film interrupted the flow of the story. But they were meant to give the audiences an understanding of the true complexities of dissociative identity disorder and how the scientific community rejects the notion of something almost supernatural as being beyond explainable. These segments oftentimes interrupt the flow of the film, but are necessary to understanding the inspiration of the subject matter, how the identities of people with this disorder can possess different physical attributes based on the personalities of the character. So that when we flip back to James McAvoy's character, we would have a better understanding on what his identities or was taking over who he was and who he would then become. And McAvoy was excellent as the many characters he portrayed. Although we only really saw eight of them on screen, this guy could hands down deliver all 22 of those personalities if need be. He, he is creepy at times, charming, and other times a complete menace. But what you need to watch for, which is always key with anyone enacting a character with a dissociative identity disorder, are the various ticks, The transitions from character to character when the camera never flinches. 
That is, when the camera is on the face, you see that hint of that something, that's something that triggers the character to flip or to change or a different personality to bring, come forth and take over a body. That is brilliant when someone does it well. McAvoy was skillful at this and his performance was truly impressive. I gave him hands down. I walked out of the theater. I'm like, give that guy an Oscar. You know, I would, I could imagine that it's very difficult to do that, to be able to go from character to character at a whim, but yet, you know, you're a trained actor. So therefore you should be able to do certain things like that. But a lot of people maybe can't. The next person I, I really like the three, these are the three main actresses uh, and actors in this movie. And Anna Taylor-Joy, to round it all out, just a great performance. And it's all about the eyes. You know, she, if you ever watch The Witch, which you should, this young lady is very good at expressing many different emotions with just a look. With M. Light Shyamalan's style of filmmaking, where he likes close-ups on faces and particularly the eyes, she's the perfect casting as the damaged emo teen who looks weak on the outside but possesses a certain strength within that enables her to think rationally during tense situations, such as being kidnapped. This moment early on in the movie, actually it's just at the beginning where you see that strength come forth. She's in the car with them and he's just gassed everyone else, put everyone else to see, sprayed them with that. I don't know what he sprayed them with, but it knocked them out. And he was just going about his thing, this effect, because he's, this character, I forgot the main, uh, the guy who did the kidnapping, Baron, I don't know what his name, Brian, but he was, he's OCD, so he's wiping down the car with a disinfectant wipe. He's just wiping down the car, wiping down his hands, just cleansing himself. And she's just sitting right next to him. He didn't gas her yet because why? She didn't react. She didn't yell. She didn't do anything. So that gave her a moment to escape. But when she tried to escape, she failed. And then that's when he gassed her. But it was that moment where she knew she had messed up. And then he turns to her and he's just looking at her and her expression just morphed. And, you know, those just those dark brown eyes, you know, they're not black, but they look black on screen, but they're just dark brown. And her expression just changes. Her eyes pull with tears and then boom, he sprays her and she's out. She's very good in this role. I thought that was great casting. And unfortunately, you know, for any of these creepy movies like this, they would likely go after her. But if you ever see want to see another and another example where I thought she did well with with not doing much, you know, was in um Morgan, a previous film. It was released last year where she played this character, this teenager who was made in a lab and she was almost like a robot of sorts. And so you had those three actors. Those were great performances for M. Night Shyamalan. I don't know. He, he, does, he doesn't like indifferent people. I wouldn't say indifferent, but he really utilized their attributes. And maybe it's a look. Maybe it's just the way they carry themselves or a body disposition. He really uses those to the advantage of the character. And I really thought that was, first of all, great casting for this film. And it just worked. It just worked for me. Now, let's go to M. Night Shyamalan himself in the film directing style here. I like him split to a basketball metaphor. Just keep shooting or to finding Dory. Dory just kept swimming, and in doing so, she was able to retrace a path back to her family, which led to an explanation as to why she is the way she is, which now allows her to live a purposeful life. Now, that's uh, only apropos, but it works for this analogy, kind of. M. Night Shyamalan is a filmmaker. No box office failure can take that weight away from him. You watched the 2015's The Visit, and this year's The Split, and it's on full display for all who pays to see. However, he's not doing anything new. He's applied the same storytelling techniques notable to his style. Difference is, he's not at the top. He's an underdog, again, scrapping his way back into the conversation with a movie people enjoy. And now, it's a box office success. Okay, let's be honest. To be it in Hollywood guarantees you work. And right now, I guess the it guy is M. Night Shyamalan, but he's been in this position before with, um... The success of this movie, Split, he is at least secure for his next job, which may or may not be a sequel to this film. But if you follow Hollywood, you know that if immediate, like normally after like two, two weeks at the box office or sometimes even a week after a successful um, 
box office opening boom next thing you know you have an announcement that there may be a sequel and there's been talk about a possible sequel to split but how much do we put faith into a relatively one hit wonder okay two hit wonder signs actually did well well in the box office although everyone almost everyone hated it okay the aliens again it's the aliens people hate the aliens you know you fooled me once shame on you you fooled me twice shame on everyone who brought tickets in search of the sixth sense which was a good film but it, it you know it's sixth sense was a good film it was both critically acclaimed and successful at the box office out of 10 people you ask i bet you two have ever watched that movie more than once it isn't possible. The movie loses traction towards the big reveal ending that made the suspense narrative so effective. This style of storytelling is used throughout all of all movies written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. But unfortunately, he just couldn't grasp audiences' imaginations so easily multiple times around. The success of Split reminds me of that moment he had with The Sixth Sense. And that was like what? some 20 15 years ago when m night could basically do no wrong he had hollywood in the palm of his hands and believing that he could produce something magical he's a sort of born again newcomer with the, the generation of the sixth sense now older with children who were their age when that movie first debuted Shyamalan doesn't have to prove that he's a filmmaker he has to prove that his movies can pull in huge box office numbers it sucks to say but that's the given skepticism surrounding his track record huge box office and low attendance doesn't easily convince many many studios to put their chips on the supernatural when horror movies or thrillers are a real hit and miss these days and as fickle as it may seem if your weird movie doesn't make money at the box office then your weird movie don't get made okay doesn't get made to stay afloat, to stay working, you have to make other people's movies that are out of your wheelhouse, i.e. Avatar, The Last Airbender, and After Earth. Two failures that weren't exactly all his fault, but his fault nonetheless since he was the director, and that's the way the film crumbles. With Split, you know, it played, it's, it was like three weeks at the, at the top of the box office, maybe even four, I'm not sure. He struck gold with that film. What's to follow is the true testament as to if the old and current generation of moviegoers will accept his stories as entertainment, no matter how odd or weird they are. Let's face it, he is someone who focuses on the supernatural. And if it's not done well, then people will shy away from his films like they did before, just like with Lady in the Water or The Village, where we liked what he was doing. We wanted him to do well. We wanted to believe that these movies were good, but eh, it didn't turn out to be exactly what we wanted in the end. But if you're a true fan of him, he's doing everything he's done before. You cannot like The Last Airbender or After Earth. Yes, those things are horrible, but fans of M. Night Shyamalan will remain fans of M. Night Shyamalan. But if you're new, you might not really take to his style and got that from a lot of people it's just talking to people just randomly who have seen split they are actually split some people loved it like myself but then other people are like oh i didn't like it it's the same re response you got from unbreakable where people wanted to like it because they thought it was just going to be this one thing and then it went another direction now he's either smart or just going with the times found footage horror is a thing has been for the last four, five, six years. Yeah, last year's The Visit piggybacked on that theme. Audiences love it for some odd reason. For many, it's what horror is these days. But just for a moment, let's consider two other films that came out that year. It Follows and Don't, Don't Breathe. A little old with something new. That is using many old horror thriller tropes, but then adding that bit of difference to make those movies something unlike much of what we've seen before. The Visit was good, but it introduced nothing new to the genre, and Split was, was enjoyable as it is a well-told story. However, I can't just credit the movie being that awesome based on pure merit. Think about it as a teen horror movie. 
You know, it starts out with the three girls that get kidnapped, but yet then it morphs into something else. And it's all about, uh, I want to say sleight of hand, but it's like a magic trick. Uh, we show you what's going on here so you don't look at what's going on there. And I believe this movie was basically one of those. It was a psychological thriller encased in a teen horror movie. Seriously, what gets people into the theater? Teen horror movies. He gave you a teen horror movie, but then he added that little bit of M. Night Shyamalan in there. Where Shyamalan likes to study the metaphysical, the supernatural. And he does it well. He puts in extensive research into his subject matters. Sometimes they just don't sell to crowds. You know, we don't want to be taught anything. We just want to be entertained. So if you take this movie about three girls who get kidnapped by this menacing man and then introduces a uh, an element, um, a thriller, a horror element into the movie, which is this other character that is supposed to be that's supposed to come in and kill them. You have smartly got people to the theater and now you just have to entertain them with your style, with your story. So I thought that was brilliant. It's just like, it's just like um, The Visit. The Visit was the same thing, dealing a lot with the dissociative identity disorder. It had something else. It was what? Just another found footage movie, which could be considered a horror film at the time. And that's what how they that's how they promoted it. So maybe he's learning now that he can't just go against Hollywood. You have to blend in with it. You can't go in and say, I'm just going to make a movie like this because they're not going to go for that. You know, they don't want you to go lecture people. They just want you, they want you to entertain them. But if you can, if you can include that into your film, but then make it marketable, then boom, it could be a success. Let's consider Unbreakable being introduced now into this realm of superhero movies. Say if we follow the same trajectory now, The Visit was his kind of found footage, 2000 and whatever horror thriller movie. Okay. And now we have Split, which is his teen movie you know he made a little teen movie what if he now what if around this time before split or you know at this time you know he did okay i guess you could put it into that super into that realm if it is that a superhero movie i don't take those as a superhero movie it's a story about someone who becomes superhuman he is more so focusing on how the character becomes who he is he's flirting with the plot narrative of the comic book and the super comic book superheroes, the dichotomy between the two and how these relationships develop and then come together. And if you ever watched Will Smith, Will Smith in the movie Hancock, with those two people with superpowers, they can't really exist in one place all the time. The hero and the nemesis, they will always find each other. They're attracted to one another because of this innate force, bringing them together to to do battle maybe they just can't exist together and that's why i love you know unbreakable and what mr glass was saying you know he needed a reason you know a lot of people trying to find their reason what is my reason and in that movie it was all about finding your reason so if we had unbreakable released today and what if they announced it as this is a superhero movie what type of attraction would that bring to this genre this is a totally different look it's without the explosions it's without the people flying around what if we dealt with the mundane of the superhero as we see with unbreakable and split it's dealing with the concept of it it's not saying that this is because he doesn't have to call this a superhero movie these are just two people two forces in within a universe that can't coincide together without trying to eliminate one another if you remember the they have the Highlander, there can be only one. And it's kind of weird that they can't exist because it's all about the psychological nature because even the evildoer has his way of thinking that vindicates his actions. Just like as Mr. Glass, when he was committing all those uh, atrocities, he was doing it selfishly, trying to find his purpose. But in doing so, he, he killed a lot of people. Subsequently, that makes him a bad guy um the guy in split well this character believes that he's fighting for the weak that he's a prime example of the weak and how the weak can become strong and separate themselves from those who think they are perfect and, and you know, another thing people m night Shyamalan can write 
seriously, the man has skills. If there was one thing that struck out to me when, what is it, Dennis, or as we would name him now, the Horde, was he says something. He says to Casey, he says, the damaged or the broken are the more evolved. Um, perfect example of someone who hasn't lived the perfect life. Because anyone who lives the perfect life, those who haven't suffered, will never truly know life. Because you haven't felt. This guy was all in his head. He was, his vindication was that he was going to prove to everyone that people with disorders, especially this disorder, can become something more than what they are. You're seen as weak. You're seen as an undertow of society. Or well, these identities, when they created this character, were trying to reconcile the atrocities inflicted upon them when Kevin Crump was a child. Shyamalan. He doesn't really, he's not really focused in trying to make his comic book movies. The thing is, he was so passionate about, he was passionate about the idea of the superhero and the relationships between the two characters, the the forces that bring them together and not so much about their attributes and what you can do with those attributes. It's about the psychological nature of it all. If you think about what the mind and body can do, that's another thing that the, um, that the doctor, when she was speaking to, I think Dennis, yeah, one of the, the identity I, I missed before his name was Dennis. He was the main one, the main uh, orchestrator. He was one of the main him and Scarlett or Charlotte. Uh, they were the main, the main identities within Kevin Crumb, helping give life to this new being inside them. I'm pretty sure if Unbreakable was announced, then no, they're saying like, let's say he has a third sequel, a sequel to this one. And so it's uh, within this trilogy that he may or may not make. He said that before. Before I heard his next film would be a sequel to this, but then within like what, the third week at number one, the headline read that, oh no, well, he said it might be his second, third movie. So whatever, but... As the story got out that the next one is part of this superhero thing, I, uh, superhero genre, that I don't really think that it will bring people to theaters. I think it would bring to the, the people to the theaters based on the nature of the of Split. And hopefully everyone who's curious now will go back and revisit Unbreakable, a film that needs attention. And if you really want to see Unbreakable, I'm going to do something maybe this weekend. I hope I can post it with this or something thereafter because I'm not done speaking about this. I have another episode where I want to speak about the idea of the superhero and the supernatural and what humans can do. I exactly have to be, you know, bit by spiders and or injected with a superhuman concoction to make them stronger. How the meek can become the super. Think about this as his third act. Back in 2003, he M. Night Shyamalan, you know, the Sixth Sense debuted. He had that success, success, but then people lost interest in his film. Then comes the second act where he had to make other people's films. He had to take director's jobs just to kind of stay afloat and keep his name out there and so now you have your third act where you have split and it looks like maybe a new idea whereas you, you get a sense of what's happening now in films and then you try to manipulate that and use it in your in your own work to help market it so maybe the next film will be a pseudo superhero movie if you watch this one and you watch unbreakable then it would maybe give you a sense of what's to come next. And with that idea, it's not going to just be a superhero hero movie with two characters just bah, 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 going at it. I think it would have to be, he would have to go in and find some other way to address it. Some, and explore some idea, uh, ideological nature between how they come together. And then that will determine how the saga would end. Or not end, you know, because part of a saga is being something that just keeps going for a long time. It's possible that he could do that, but, you know, not making any assumptions. Do, do I want to see it? Yes, I would not mind because I just like I like this idea of exploring a, a narrative based around the superhero genre without having to be superhero. A few films have done this, like Chronicle, uh, people just with who assume attributes and then it's um up to them to determine what they do with those attributes chronicle and then they have another one called slight it's supposed to be the the, the urban version of chronicle but uh, i saw a clip of it it looks all right it looks okay 
and I will watch it, you know, once it comes out. But I don't know. It just maybe it seems a little generic. It's nothing like this. But um, if they're able to do what he, I mean, it make it make the whole superhero aspect of it subtle. But instead of like hitting us on the head with it and say this is a superhero movie, watch these two characters, characters go at it. And I'm not saying like super like Marvel and them they like they don't explore these things because they do. If you actually watch them, like suit like Civil War and all them, they do have some narratives in there that are more than just good guy bad guy, and they're gonna fight in the end. A lot of times, your villain always has some reason why they want to destroy whatever they uh, want to destroy but if you think about civil war and these two and just recently with civil war and how these characters how these people they're just basically fighting on the side of what they thought was right okay like should we register ourselves or should we not why does the government have to control us why do we have to be pawns to the government we can be pawns or we can be weapons that you know if you watch that for that narrative is very strong and so they have deep narratives as well. M. Night Shyamalan, I don't know if he was ever, if he ever studied psychology, but he really likes it. And you can see that passion in his work. It's sort of like Michael Crichton. And Michael Crichton was a doctor. And so in a lot of his novels, you will find of this medical, these scientific and medical descriptions that are just really drawn out and very well explained. He was knowledgeable in that, but yet he could take that and then put it into movies, put it into his books and make it interesting, make it entertaining. So I really like that. Is this his third act? Is this uh, M. Night Shyamalan third act? Well, and, you know, and let's talk about the third act. The third act is, that's where a lot of these movies fall apart. And just just like we said, I said with Split before, it has you going, it's building up, building up, but then towards the end, it just slows down. And if you think about, go back, if you ever go back and watch Signs, it's just as suspenseful as The Sixth Sense. It was the reveal that audiences hated, but it was just as suspenseful. But why show the alien? I believe at the time I murmured those exact words. Difference is, I like the movie. I really like the movie more than The Sixth Sense. Signs didn't really, did not, didn't rely as heavily on the third act as The Sixth Sense, but all the thematic elements included in those final scenes made for good heart palpitating moments. M. Night films rely on that third act and sometimes it's within the third act where the story loses momentum set by the entire film i felt this way with split as well where the last few moments of the film were too long in duration and not as climactic as presumed by the build-up of the aforementioned plot line not that it was horrible or distracting but it did kind of loosen the tension on my heartstrings a bit before the big payoff that sent me giddy from the auditorium like a six-year-old child with one of those big-ass lollipops no one should ever eat. Exactly. Seriously, people, why do we, have you ever eaten one of those big-ass lollipops? You know, they're about the size of, like, your face, and they're multicolored. But there's the big-ass lollipops, and you, did you ever eat one of those? I remember eating them, and I can actually remember the taste, the tang of them. And just now I wonder, why? Why would you buy that for me? <laughs> why would you buy me that damn lollipop you have to be superhuman to finish that damn thing or have some endocrine system that will be able to break that stuff down and flush it through your system right away because that was a lot of sugar and a, and you just have to you lick it you can't like put it in your mouth you just have to lick the damn thing but whatever i digress so are we split yes we're gonna stay split on him because we just don't know what he will do next and maybe that's good but now you can probably say M. Night Shyamalan without people wincing and giving you that stank face like, mm, I, don't, I don't like his movies. I still like him as I am a fan of his. But, you know, just like a lot of directors that you that, that you have that you, you know, there's some Woody Allen movies I don't like. As you like somebody, one of these directors, you know, it's OK for them to fail. You have to look at what you really like about his films and enjoy that aspect of it. With M. Night, I can enjoy parts of the storyline. I can enjoy his cinematography. I can enjoy his exploration of the psychological and supernatural. Those things are all interesting to me. And so therefore, I can enjoy it a little bit more than someone else who just wants to go and be entertained. Sometimes they're not interesting movies. They're just well-made films. So if you're really interested in that, um, in M. Night Shyamalan, we recently did an episode. It's called, it's our episode 50. And it's, um, that was our yearly discussion about Unbreakable. And I'm going to post 
So you look for that. You can look for that later. Um, I'll notify you when I do it. But I'm going to post like our first episodes. But instead of just putting those episodes out there, I think I want to listen through it and maybe do a commentary on our own podcast. I won't do it on the recent number 50 because there are some things that I did go into with that film. Maybe I'll look at it over and then and then write some write up some um, notes on it. I'll go into the podcast. That first one, I think I'll just take it apart. I know we had a great discussion about it, so I want to take that apart. So if you need a listening companion when you watch that movie to maybe understand what's going on, I, that episode is actually great. It's going to be Talking with Fritos and look for it. You can search for it. It's called Breaking Down the Unbreakable. It's going to be from our archives. And there's only like, oh, I don't know how many in there, like 20 or so episodes in the archives that I will release later on down the line. I know I've been saying that for a while but with this one it's going to be that so but i'm going to take it out so it's not because it's a two-parter maybe almost three hours three three and a half hours and i might do a commentary on that just so we can take out some of the good elements of it and then use those as a discussion to help you if you are confused about unbreakable or need a little bit of insight or want to hear why we thought this movie is so great and why we gush over it to me it is the number one superhero movie i'm sorry and i don't want to, and i shouldn't really label it that right superhero movie but that's what i think i think it is the best superhero movie out there it explores something that many other movies within this genre don't the subtle na- nature of the superhero not just that entity as itself or in itself you know what the plate's full, but I'm open for suggestions. So so if you guys want to contact us, go ahead to go to talking with Brito slash contact and you'll be able to find out all our information there. What, you know, our Facebook stuff, hookups, you can find our links there. You can find out our email address, all those on talkingwithbrito.com slash contacts. Thank you for listening. And as always, I appreciate it. And that's a wrap, but not a burrito. 